stage with us. Uh, David Axelrod's eighth collection of poems, The Open Hand, appeared recently in Lost Horse Press. His second collection of nonfiction, The Eclipse, I Call Father, Essays on Absence, just appeared in Oregon State University Press. Recent work appears in Aji, uh, Cloud Bank, The Singing Bowl, and Under a Warm Green Linden. Axelrod wrote the introduction to My Interests Are People for About People, photographs by Gert Berliner which appeared in the summer of 2018, uh, Arts and Books. Uh, David Oxara directs the Low Residency MFA in w and Wilderness Ecology and Community Program at Eastern Oregon University. In addition to this service, um, he also edits the Basalt a Journal of Fine and Literary Arts and serves on the editorial board of Lynx House Press. So with that, I would like to introduce David Axelrod and let him talk about his work. Um, thank you all for coming. I, I want to especially say thank you to uh, Dr. Fuentes uh, for giving me the opportunity to speak today. Uh, can you hear okay? Am I coming through? Okay, great. Um, thank you all for taking the time out of your afternoon to be here. Um, uh, it's the first time, in fact, I've had the opportunity to read uh, aloud um, from this new book. Uh, since it was just published two weeks ago. And this will be the first time I've given uh, it a close look in many months, so uh, it's likely I may be as surprised as you are by what comes <laughs> out of my mouth. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I hope that it's pleasant enough. Um, I thought instead of just reading one piece uh, today, I would just read short passages from as many as a half dozen essays um, or as time allows, uh, but regardless, I, I promise uh, not to be too long at, at this. Um, the first, the first uh, passage I wanted to read uh, is from the middle of an essay called Accretions of Absence. I wanted to call this book for the longest time Accretions of Absence, but my editor said they refused to publish it if I called it that. <laughs> no one would buy such a book, and so <laughs> it's like, okay, I, I, I get it. Um, so, uh, uh, I, I think that this passage of this essay in particular uh, states the problem uh, or the, the challenge that's central to the rest of the book and the rest of the essays. Um, and it goes like this. Josefa and I once lived briefly on a broad terraced mountainside in Andalusia. We walked the ancient trails on the mountainside for an entire month, following herds of Nubian goats from pasture to pasture. The canyon below us had been occupied many thousands of years before civilization arrived with its einkorn and threshing circles paved with moon-reflecting mica flagstones. Our first human ancestors walked out of Africa onto that mountainside. Our month there was miserable, cold, and snowy. After a week of burning olive wood in a smoky tin stove, we'd failed to raise the heat of the cavernous 700-year-old house enough so as not to see our breath. Below the house, an ancient mill crumbled into ruins beside the river Romans spanned with an arched bridge of quarried stone. The weedy, cobbled Roman road climb toward the opposite ridge and the trade routes of the Imperium. That former Berber village now consisted of 35 connected stucco houses that seemed like a deserted beehive. Only at night, a light burned at the interior of those cells, just a faint and distant glow on a small window pane. One morning, Walking that former imperial road along the south side of the river, we were surprised by an Iberian ibex ram asleep beneath a gorse. We froze mid-step and said nothing. Face to face with something wild and elemental, we assumed at any moment he would leap to his feet, shake himself alert, challenge us to back down. We held our breath as time deepened and grew denser all around us. 
The Sierra Nevada snows lingered high above, and below lay the coast, Africa across the sea, and the whole continent beyond. The Ibix, however, didn't rise, because he wasn't asleep but dead. Yet another surprise followed upon our alert attention, a kind of dread, as though we'd stumbled on evidence of something forbidden. We looked around to see if anyone was watching, then we turned our back to the corpse. His big, milky, slatted eyes gazed blankly at the Andalusian sky. A full curl of horns, a thick, tawny winter coat, and no sign at all of what killed him. It was one of the first warm days. Snowmelt swelled the river. Rock thrushes sang off in the scrub, and the rock face we stood beneath sang its loud devotional echo of the river's shimmering voice below. Across the canyon, a goat herd whistled to his dog who moved the Nubians from one paddock to another. On sunny south-facing terraces, the almond trees seemed suddenly to have burst into pink blossom. I can't fully account for why a moment like that is so resonant with strangeness and wonder, though when one lives abroad, the perception of the depth and density of time and place often seems more readily accessible than it does at home. For the residents of such a village in the Sierra Nevada, you have to admit there is likely considerable less strangeness and wonder. Everyone else probably knew about the ram, how it died and when, or who murdered it. Yet for us, the oddness of that tiny, impoverished village hanging off the terraced mountainside and its mythical past as a refuge for Moorish princes to whom sorrowful nightingales sang, the presence everywhere of what was absent and the mystery of that absence demanded accounting, an invented narrative. Factual or fanciful, it hardly mattered. Sojourners like us are forced at every moment to explain the world to ourselves. The more pointed question, though, is posed on return to the familiar world of one's home. How shall we perceive the familiar as possessed of the same densities and depths of strangeness and wonder as that moment on the Roman road? Privileged as we are to visit places that the permanent residents often can't leave, we return home to the same predicament as they who never depart. How can we learn to look at the familiar as if it were occupied now and forever by the accumulated presences of the past that only appear on the surface as absent? To live in this manner is to dwell in gratitude for a world full of astonishing resonances. The depth and density of presence in the world is so powerful that there is no place in, on, or of this earth that does not see us for who and what we are. So <laughs> that, uh, that, that desire to try to see past the surface of things that are so familiar we hardly even see them anymore um, becomes uh, pretty much the, uh, my cause, uh, as it were, uh, in the rest of the essays. Uh, that uh, I think that awareness of the presence is um, such as I described there is something I was I've been aware of since childhood and uh, especially uh, in a place my family often visited on our uh, farm in Ohio and where I, I visited a couple years ago again and that is the homestead of the Wrights. Um, it's in the middle of our farm now, but it was a neighboring farm before uh, World War II when my uncle Bill bought it. Uh, and what's remarkable about the Wrights is they were, uh, they were free slaves. Uh, they had purchased their uh, freedom. The father had Cyrus, uh, uh, not Wright, but... Uh, or Edinburgh Cyrus had purchased his freedom and his family's freedom 
uh, early in the 19th century and moved north. And it's a remarkable story. And I'm not going to tell it here. You'll have to buy the book <laughs> to, to read it. But um, uh, they were a, a remarkable people, but they were remarkable too in that they so were a part of our family story. And then they just vanished. Um, but we always would spend uh, summer picnics at their homestead next to, the, uh, next to the foundation stones of their house, uh, their uh, spring room, and barn. Uh, but it, while I was there, I found them. Uh, I, it turned out that their descendants were living very close by, as ignorant of us as we were of them. Uh, but I, I'll just share with you the opening of this essay uh, and leave all the rest of that to your own curiosity. It's called The Evidence of Things Not Seen. On a recent April morning, my cousin Betty Mills and I walked to the Wright place together in the rain. The Wrights were an African-American farm family, my grandmother's and her siblings' neighbors when they were still children in the 1920s. The Wrights preceded our family on that ridge in the Appalachian foothills of Ohio by at least a generation. My grandmother's brother, William, was only the second Mills to farm there. The grandfather purchased the Chambers farm in the aftermath of the Civil War. And I, I think the Chambers were likely, an, uh, they were a little finer stuff than us. Uh, and, uh, the women were educated, and uh, they were abolitionists. Uh, and uh, the uh, Underground Railroad was very much active in the area. Um, since my childhood, when I first heard anecdotes about the rights, they have loomed large in my reveries. Over the years, whenever I go down home to use my grandmother's preferred expression for visiting the farm, I've taken time to walk to the site, forested now, where the Wright's cabin and barn once stood. After dinner the evening before our walk, Betty and I were standing at the top landing of the central staircase facing a low chest of drawers from which Betty pulled out a folder bound in string. Inside was a letter she handed to me saying, I think this might interest you. Owing to the revelations of that letter recently discovered in the attic of the old farmhouse, and despite our walking along the familiar farm lane we'd walked together many times before, I was seeing the world around me with new eyes. The uncanceled two-cent stamp on the envelope dated the composition of the letter inside to sometime between 1919 and 1928, though there's, a good, there's good reason to believe it dates from earlier in that period of time. The Millses, Betty's grandparents, were the recipients. The heavy printed capital letters seemed to have been composed with a carpenter's pencil, and each flat stroke making up a grapheme was written over a second time before moving on to the next stroke. The circular embossed two cent stamp with white lettering over red ink and George Washington silhouette at its center had the letters KKK written along the upper right-hand edge of the stamp. The letter is addressed to the insane farm and colored infirmary. I unfolded the stationery inside. Its edges were periodically missing wedges cut out with scissors, two wedges from the top and bottom and three from both the left and right edges to create a sense, I imagined, of menace albeit a cartoonish sort of men menace for sure. At the top margin was a drawn image of a manacle pointing ominously toward a skull and crossbones and the word beware, beware. The remaining text, all in capital letters, with many letters reversed, confirms the implacable dread the top line intended to provoke. On or before sunrise of April 17, you will both be burned to death or shot to pay the penalty for burning three barns and trying to kill the Cox family. It was signed KKK. The addressees seem, at least in part, inconsistent with the accusation, 
and threat being lodged. If the Millses were in any way suspected of burning down the Cox's barns or otherwise presenting an existential threat to that family, why then drag the African-American neighbors, presumably the Wrights or others living nearby, into this quarrel? Betty had told me a year before our walk that April, mor that April morning that the barn at the top of the farm lane today was in fact the Wrights' barn, moved from its original foundations to its present site only after her father, William, purchased the Wrights' former property during the Second World War. I didn't know then that the original barn had burned down, much less the reason why, nor did she. We might wonder how Harvey and Elizabeth Mills responded to the threat. Elizabeth, as proper a Presbyterian lady as ever there was, made her feelings famously clear when she referred to the source of the threat as those cocksuckers. Given the two references to the KKK, an inventive racial epithet with the added syllable, one wonders if the accusation is simply a pretext for something else entirely, that is, racist contempt for whatever relations, practical if not cordial, may or may not have existed between the Wrights and the Mills families during the era of Jim Crow. There's another unpleasant anecdote regarding Elizabeth that may be related to these matters and perhaps sheds light on racial tensions in rural Ohio in the early 20th century. The now elderly daughter-in-law of my grandmother's sister, Myrtle, recently wrote to Betty, as for the Wright family, you probably heard the same story, that there was a knock at the back door, and Elizabeth called out, if you are white, come in, if you are black, stay out, only to find Mr. Wright at the door. It is a strange incident to remember, perhaps even stranger to expect others to recognize it not as explicitly racist and humiliating for all parties involved, but as some kind of benign, somehow comic, uh, or even quirky family anecdote. It's also weird how these two scraps of anecdotes regarding Elizabeth Mills, vulgar and mean-spirited, are all that remain of the supposedly most proper Presbyterian lady's own spoken words. Are they memorable, we might ask, because they are otherwise so out of character? That seems to be the family consensus. In any event, neither Harvey nor Elizabeth were murdered by or before sunrise on April 17, 1920-something or other. Harvey died of respiratory disease in 1926, and Elizabeth of cancer in 1935. In retribution for their offenses, however, their barn was burned to the ground by the letter writers. And it turns out, uh, I have just learned recently, that um, there's carvings on the wall of the uh, inside, in the granary. Uh, I have never seen them. I've played in the granary many times. But apparently, uh, uh, some of the Wrights and some of the Ormses and some uh, Millses have all written messages to each other in, in the wood. But, uh, no one is sophisticated quite enough to figure out how to photograph it. <laughs> so I, I, it's a way of coercing me to come home uh, to pay me back for this essay. Uh, uh, yeah. So I started to wonder, though, you know, because I always returning to these places, um, that place, particularly from my childhood, I started wondering about. Um, other people later in life who return from the lives they have lived to the place of origin, uh, that they feel as though they've somehow not known as fully as they needed to, and that in order to live the full, the full life, they had to return. So I wrote this essay um, that's called... Uh, uh, a note left on a mountain in which I recount uh, stories of three men like that. Um, as in all of these, uh, except in family mostly, I, I don't change names, but mostly the names are changed to protect the guilty. 
And, uh, and uh, so tell this is the story of uh, someone called Richard McFarland. After a close call with my own death in my mid-30s, I met Richard McFarland, who lived alone without phone or electricity far down the Imnaha River. I had, early express, I had earlier expressed to a friend my desire to meet people who abandoned the lives they created to return to the lost landscapes of childhood. A friend of a friend supplied Richard's address in that remote canyon. It's a striking landscape, the one he was hoping to reclaim. Canyon walls of ochre-colored columnar basalt are interspersed with broad, grassy benches that rise thousands of feet above the canyon floor, where a primitive road winds above the river. From that rough road, the broad western sky narrows to a channel of blue, mirroring the river below. Depending on the season, the road is either rutted, muddy, or dusty as it divides into various trails leading to backcountry ranches and camps. Having never traveled into the area, I arranged through a series of letters over several weeks to meet Richard at the mouth of Lightning Creek. At the appointed time, he stood waiting, leaning against his flatbed truck and contempt, uh, contempt <laughs> I can't even say it now, um, contempt, <laughs> help me. I, this happened once before reading. I can't. He's thinking. Uh, he's thinking to himself. I just sorry for the moment of aphasia, uh, uh, smoking a pipe of tobacco and thinking deep thoughts. Uh, when he saw me in the twilight, he leaned forward and shoved his tall, thin frame away from the front fender of his truck. He gestured to follow along a dirt track that led through galleries of cottonwoods along Lightning Creek. The wide metal edge of the flatbed that served as a bumper was plastered with stickers of decidedly liberal causes, everything from gay rights to paid maternity leave, an unusually iconoclastic set of political beliefs for that isolated area of Northeast Oregon. According to the USGS map I consulted earlier, the trail to his cabin wound five miles crossing several fords that I soon discovered required a degree of heroics on the part of my little truck over whose hood the current washed. The river cobbles slipped away beneath the tires and I thought for sure that the truck would founder, the headlights glowing vaguely under the green water. Meanwhile, lightning flashed overhead and thunder exploded with such concussive force it gave substance to the air its echo repeating for miles. In the silence before the next strike came the sound of rocks skating down basalt cliffs in the nearby dark. I pitched my tent far from the canyon walls across the meadow near the creek and joined Richard on the porch of the cabin where we shared a flask as the rain poured then abruptly stopped, leaving just the sound of water dripping from leaves and the ambient song of the creek. When I asked, Richard said his return to the landscape of childhood 70 years ago was prompted by worrisome little messages, warnings. I didn't know what he meant. Sometimes we get a little too serious for our own good, he said. What you discover when you return to your place of origin, he said, if there is anything such as an intact place to return to, you figure out pretty quickly that, and here he trailed off without finishing his thought. The singular fact about Lightning Creek is that there are no people. There's little evidence of occupation besides sporadic arrivals and departures, cattle drives in spring and fall, a few wanderers appearing on three-day holiday weekends in summer, fewer and fewer hunters as the season turns toward winter and the country above shuts down. The intimacies of Richard's childhood, all that seemed permanent then, the open-endedness of time as parents and their friends following herds and harvests, appeared scarce now, 70 years on. What we imagine we will find, we fail to find, but that isn't the same as saying it does not exist. 
In his poem, Basho, the Dutch writer Cees Nootboom observed once that what vanished is still there, is something that vanished. And that was largely borne out by Richard's experience. The next morning, under strikingly calm, clear skies, he and I stood in the glistening meadow beside Lightning Creek. We lit a fire in a ring of stones and boiled water for tea. Following his service in the Navy during the Korean War, Richard finished college, then lived aimlessly until, during the Kennedy administration, he joined the Peace Corps. After several years in Africa, he, quote, pursued a career, a vagueness that seemed intended as a judgment of that pursuit. He retired at the first opportunity, and then, his blood cells presenting some abnormalities, he hired on as a ranch hand in Lightning Creek, where his own parents had worked as hired hands when they were young. He was born nearby in 1926. He told me that he would probably die in the cabin behind us. The Imnaha Canyon is one of those few places that remains more or less as it was a lifetime ago. The paved road, electricity, and phone didn't arrive anywhere in the canyon until well into the second half of the 20th century, and had still not arrived at Richard's cabin. That canyon was among the last places in the contiguous United States to enter the modern era as we commonly think of it, the age of displacement, rootlessness, and loss. As such, there is still a recognizable place to return to there, a past seen, albeit through a liminal scrim. Over black tea, Richard asked if I had noticed the tall ponderosa on the hillside at the canyon's mouth. It's the tree Chief Joseph used to orient his retreat from General Howard's army. They began their war here. That tree marked the way across a low point to the, in the ridge to Doug Bar. That's where he got his people across the river holding onto the manes of their horses as they swam. I imagine it was a somber crossing. They were leaving this country and must have wondered if they would ever see it again. After a long pause, Richard looked up a little surprised at his emotion. He laughed and pointed out that when Howard arrived, it took him three days to move his army across the same place in the river. I think that tree is really not the original, though everyone wishes it were, and it could be, I suppose. We sat in silence again for several more minutes while an azure bunting sang near the creek. Otherwise, the morning remained still. When he spoke again, he was still thinking about the Nez Perce retreat from eastern Oregon to Bear Paw, Montana. So much happened after Joseph crossed that river. A lot of it's sorrowful. You can't discount any of it. I mean, it didn't happen during my life, and the Nez Perce moved on well before my own parents came into this canyon. But it's never really over. The same is true about the camp of Chinese miners above Doug Bar, murdered for gold. That one seems a little more connected to the world I grew up in. When I was a kid, I knew who the murderers were. I'd seen them in the summer up at the Grange. But either way, what happened here doesn't go away. And no matter how isolated this place seems, it played its role too. He went on to say that he had come to prefer the idea that the pine isn't the same tree because people too often are motivated by a longing to keep things the same. History inhabits us even if we pretend we don't bear its burden. In this canyon, that particular horizon is very narrow. The burden is always here, and that hasn't made it easy to come back. If the big tree at the mountain, mouth of the canyon was the tree Joseph used to orient his strategic retreat from the corrupt finale of Manifest Destiny, you might be able to more easily ignore the fact that Joseph's body is buried beside a littered highway in Washington State, far from his father's grave and his own Wallowa homeland. The tree's continued existence would seem a form of inviolate presence,
the past persisting without the moral complications of exile. Richard sipped from his cup, and I wasn't interested really in pointing any of that out. Joseph was born just over the ridge to the north. He wasn't as lucky as Richard. He and those who followed him from this canyon and across a series of battlefields in Idaho and Montana bore the real burden of history. We looked up at the gap in the rim of the canyon. His mother had gone to Enterprise months before Richard's birth. Soon after, his father, on horseback, carried him into the canyon in his arms. An infant passing into this life through that low point on the ridge. Spain saddle, he said. We came down bench after bench of deep grass into a side canyon of the Imnaha, forded the river, and then made our way back up here, where everyone was waiting to greet me and my mother on her return. All those people who lived here are gone. I'm the only one left now. A shadow crossed his face like a bird passing between him and the sun. He teared up and apologized. I don't think I can say any more about any of this now. I'm sorry. Coming back here at this point in my life has been a little overwhelming. The day-to-day -day here is very simple, but I don't feel that way. It's not as simple as a routine. He poked the fire and then stared at the canyon walls directly above where we stood. His dilemma was clear, and the waves of emotion he felt not so helpful. I'm here or not so hopeful. I'm here and can see it, he said, referring to the community that occupied the canyon of his youth. And yet I can see it's all gone, except inside of me. Simply re-inhabiting the canyon in no way guaranteed the past that was dear to him could reveal itself, much less endure beyond his life and into the lives and words of others. And uh, how, what, how can anyone see? Let me change glasses, and I will let you know. Oh, I, I, I'm going to just read one more, um, something somewhat lighter, um, and, uh, and, and, and leave that aside. Now, I'll probably skip the last piece. But uh, um, oh, yes, it's this one. <laughs> Um, one thing that is so passed from our lives, uh, certainly uh, those of us older than 50, uh, are trains. Uh, we, we had them when we were kids, we were the, the end of them anyway. Um, but I've, I've loved trains. I, I, my family had a store next to a, a, a rail crossing near a rail yard, so it was always closed. It was not a good business plan to build it there. Uh, and, uh, and so uh, we would spend long periods of the day staring at the closed siding as trains moved back and forth, back and forth. But um, I, I, that proximity to trains always blew my mind, and they were so big and so powerful. And so I've written this long encomium to the vanishing of trains. Um, but then I was in Germany, and I could ride a train virtually anywhere. And I was just, it was, uh, it was a real busman's holiday, you know, being able to get a, 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 you know, teach a class and then take a, a, a train somewhere. But um, I'm going to recount a couple of trains here in just a short passage. And Leave some time if you have any questions. Uh, so we've been on a, a long journey uh, to Switzerland and back on the slowest train. Uh, we've made an error. Uh, we've <laughs> and I should actually thank Judd and Kathy for this, because you're the ones who got us into this. One of the greatest pleasures of my life, for sure. Um, uh, we've been on this long journey down to Switzerland, and, uh, and we, had, we, we thought we were buying tickets for the fast train, but we were getting a great deal. Uh, but it turns out that there was a certain letter missing from that, uh, the name of the train. And so it like stopped at every rural stop all day for hundreds of miles. It just took forever to get there. Uh, but we came back a week later on a somewhat quicker train. Last week, as we made our way south along the Rhine toward Zurich, on that slow train, we passed through Rottweil, 
in southwest Germany. On the pl far platform near the station stood a young father and his adolescent sons. The older, perhaps 10 years old, wore glasses and a ball cap and stood pensively with his hands behind his back. They stood beside an old steam engine at the moment firing up its boiler and pouring forth a cloud of white steam and coal smoke. Yes, there was even a coal car piled full behind the engine, ready to drench the forest in soot. I knew why they were there. Similarly, the three men I saw once while I was on a bicycle ride, uh, I'm speaking specifically of the top of Piles Canyon, you, you know where I'm, I'm, I'm speaking of. Um, the, the, well, you'll see. They, they stood on a bridge high in a mountain pass awaiting the passage of a steam engine. They had their cameras and telephoto lenses on tripods placed about the entire pass to photograph the engine from many angles. It's suspicious, if not outright illegal, in our post-9-11 world to do as those three men were doing. But in that last moment before violent history intruded on their reveries, they basked in the world as it was, as it might again someday be, all of us riding together, only a few sheepish-looking snobs in the limited first-class seats. Despite our differences, we're trying to figure out how to make this trip together work out. In the meantime, as we must wait for that train, which is very late. Let us celebrate the idea of a possibly better world in which we ride trains together. A few days later, as we blew through Rottweil again, this time on a regional express, I glimpsed, around, uh, I glimpsed another two boys standing on the near platform, jumping up and down with pleasure as we pass through the station. It's a pleasure I recognize. They are waiting for someone they love. Of my own first experiences on a train when I was those boys' age, I understand now it was the same train on which my soon-to-be mother rode back to Worcester College six years earlier after Thanksgiving in 1957. She had spent the summer nights in the company of my soon-to-be father, and they had returned to that island in a nearby lake on which they went water skiing earlier in the year. They didn't know it yet, but they would soon marry. Nor did she yet suspect that she was pregnant, though she must have wondered if something hadn't changed. My father would be alive for another five years, an almost unimaginably long time in an 18-year-old's life. The trees in the hills south of Alliance, Ohio, had already dropped their leaves, and the fields were in stubble. Frost lay on the pasture lands. She must have ridden into the winter of her 20th year in wonder. Soon it would begin to snow. How alive and happy she must have felt. So thank you so much for your patience. Uh, <laughs> I spared you the real doom and gloom. When <laughs> I, I thought better not. <laughs> well, thank you so much. We have time to open it up about 17 minutes or so for questions, comments. Um, just go ahead and raise your hand, and I'll bring you the mic for the folks online so they'll be able to hear your questions. It's always so awkward. <laughs> It could be a comment as well. Uh, if you have any questions about pedagogy, uh, <laughs> I will answer them. Uh, I will say I've had similar experiences with trains in Germany, and oops, I took the wrong one. Now oh, we're yeah, stopping yeah, yeah. every yeah, moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and all these nice people are getting off to go look at the, uh, at the factory uh, where they have made locks since the 16th century, you know, and, and everyone's happy but you. Yeah, and you're like, I have this <laughs> connecting somewhere. What's happening? Sure. Well, first of all, David, thank you for your time. Thank you for your time. Um, the 
the story, the stories that you tell, and in my mind, the visions that I developed are so more, so much more powerful when you read them than when I would read them, and I appreciate that. Um, you alluded to in your youth that you knew early on your ability to like see the absence, or well, to, I think I just meant that um, I was speaking the other day. Um, <laughs> at my rheumatologist uh, to the nurse uh, uh, who uh, had asked me some questions uh, uh, and I had uh, personal questions and I'd answered them and the subject sort of spun off into things, uh, places she'd gone uh, and places where things had happened long ago and how, um, how she felt as though the presences of people who had been there, who had had experiences there, um, in this case, uh, um, industrial death, uh, the place, the souls were still there. You could feel it. Um, and, and, and I think if any of us, you know, we visit anywhere, uh, you, you recognize even in our valley, you're in a, you're in a place where something has happened that hasn't been reconciled um, uh, in any way. And, um, and it, it feels haunted, and everything seems a little off. Um, and I know that sounds crazy, but, um, and, and maybe it is, but um, uh, I, I recall, for example, uh, one of my uh, Caillou students uh, was finishing her thesis and said, my cousins are gonna bring it over, so I'm busy. And uh, they pulled up. Uh, um, they pulled up at the curb, and I was outside working in the garden. You know, I said, "Who are these people who are sitting in the big truck and staring at me and won't get out of the truck?" And I'm like, "They're here to see the girls next door." But then I said, "No, those girls are not here to see that." And then I said, "Ah, right, I'm having visitors." But the point was is that for the Cayuse, there are places all over our valley where they don't want to go because there are so many unreconciled moments of history that haunt the place, that uh, make it hard to be here, that where we live cheerfully uh, and much to their amazement. Uh, how could you? Um, but I, I think I, I, felt, I felt that keenly forever um, and also, Similarly, I just thought of something. Uh, I, I grew up right at the edge of town um, and a big forest, but it hadn't been a forest 100 years before. It had been a farm field. And there were, there were all these, you could tell walking there, there were barns and there were houses and spring houses and so on, but there were, they weren't there, just rocks, you know, laid out on the ground. And so, I, had, I always was really captivated by that from that child. The moment I, I sneak out of the house and no one paid attention that I was gone, for sure. So, uh, you know, I don't think you're crazy. You sound like you have the heart of an archaeologist. Wow. I mean, is that. Uh, many of the places you just described, I've hiked and surveyed. And so, you know, as an archeologist, we look at the absence and we try to interpret it and, um, and contemplate that and hope that we come across somebody who can tell us and fill in the stories. So anyway, beautiful, I enjoyed your story. Well, thank you. I, I, I kind of emotional archeology, span I think, uh, in a way. Ten minutes. Folks can probably come up and talk to you individually. Or maybe you had something you didn't want to share with the great group. Uh, but thank you again so much for taking time out of your day and coming and visiting us at the colloquium. Thank you for your presentation.